Thanks very much, Jesper. Appreciate that. I love this analogy of the tug of war. It's, uh, I've definitely felt it myself. Um, lots to unpack there. So now it's a chance to dive in with our, into what great leadership actually is with our panel. Pia, Henrietta, Jesper, all here. Um, Jesper, you mentioned about uh, leaders having to engage or look at how they're going to engage more. I guess there's a, a traditional image, probably a very old stuffy image, of how um, leaders are somehow detached from the day-to-day -day workings of life and, and you know, they, they're making tough decisions on, on behalf of the workplace themselves. But actually, leaders are people as well. We've seen that in the pandemic uh, more than ever, you know? Um, we've kind of had these layers stripped bare. So they appear in all walks of life, in different ways, different paths as well. Um, I'm really interested to kick off a nice discussion. Pia, you're closest to me, so I'm gonna go with you. Um, what, what are the qualities that make for a good leader? Yeah, with uh, unfortunately 25, 30 years of experience, <laughs> I must say. Uh, there are some things that stick to me still, which is super important, and it's uh, small things like uh, how do you secure an environment where people feel that they are being seen? So how am I being seen? And create a trust uh, environment and transparency. So so communicate clearly um, and really be be close to to you to the values and yourself and uh, authentically just share vulnerability as well and things like that. so the more human you can be i have learned the stronger you are as a leader and i think many times it's perceived weak uh, as weakness but for me it's really the opposite and also i lead a agile team which is a um, where we have a three week sprints we work in and i'm actually only setting the goals for these three weeks and then i just leave the team i have, I have nothing to do with it anymore then i see them demo after three weeks the fantastic work they have done and so happy showing me what they have done and also other stakeholders, by the way, and then another three weeks. So I only set the goals and the priorities and then they are self-managing. And what I have learned from more traditional leadership, uh, where, where I think still trust communication and all that is still important also now, <clears throat> but that is that people actually, when you trust them, they give you so much back. And then they really put themselves in, in front and then they, between them find a way who's best for this, who is energy in this, who is up for it for this period, who would like to learn something now, and then it suddenly become an organic thing. I have never ever led a team like I do now that have had so much output and quality by actually putting myself a little behind, but putting some rules up and some clear communication and, and, and so on, but, but it's, it's amazing. So, so I, what I'm trying to say is that we have so many resources as humans and if you can unleash that, I think then you have the quality in, in your leadership. I can see Henrietta nodding away. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you agree? Is that what you found as well? Yeah, I think you have there so many uh, good points in what you're saying, uh, Pierre. So I definitely agree. I think if I was to, I, I think definitely the, the, the way that you're describing uh, freedom and the ability to act, mm -hmm. that's, that's what you need to create as a leader. I, if, if I was to sort of say it uh, off the tongue, I would say, as a leader, I think you need to create um, the ability of an organization to create results and, and, ha and you know, work with relationships. Mm. That's the two main focuses of leaders. But I'm more humble around saying what is good and what is bad because I think it's extremely context-driven. And um, I mostly collaborate with leaders who are in their 50s and they've been successful forever. So I'm not trying to basically change what they're doing because they are all imperfect and doing it in, in exactly their way. But what I'm trying to teach them is how to become aware of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think mm -hmm. when you describe your way of leading, Pia, I think you are, what's the quality around you is that you have a self-awareness on a high level. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference. Um, so you can be a leader in many different shapes and forms, just like you said, Phil, but the self-awareness piece is actually the most important element. You have to be... I normally popularly say you have to be a little bit schizophrenic as a, as a leader. You have to act, and while you're acting, you have to sort of be able to stand next to yourself and look at what you're doing. Um, and that's actually becoming increasingly important, as I see it, because the difference with the millennials, as you started out, Phil, mm -hmm. is that I think the... Um, I also feel it as a parent, actually. The, 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 
there's an Im increase in the request from young people on, uh, especially people with more authority, having the self insight and the self awareness and the self irony and being able to sort of, you know, put yourself a little bit in parenthesis and not be so, so you know, authoritarian, classically authoritarian. So that's happening right now. That's what I see the most. So results and relationships and then the self awareness. That's what I would go for. It sounds exhausting in a way <laughs> to to be a leader, like to to to, to work on this schizophrenic <laughs> level, as you call it. No, well, you could also say it's more relaxing, Phil, because it gives you the 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 right to step next to yourself and say, "That didn't come out right. Uh, help me here," mm -hmm. because I think another important shift that's going on right now. So I've been working with leadership for more than twenty years, most of the time as an advisor, but also as a leader. <laughs> Um, and I would say one of the shifts going on right now is we, in, during the 20 years, I think we've over-focused on the individual. Leadership is a relationship, right? Mm, so I think we should focus on the relationship rather than the individual. And that actually gives you a little bit more, as a leader, you don't have to be as perfect anymore, right? Because it's in the relationship. We have to, it's, 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 um, there's a, there's a two-way street in leading, right? Mm. And, and the good mm. thing is, most of us have really, really good colleagues, really good people that we are leading, so it's not that hard. <laughs> no, it's a very good point. Uh, it's about relations instead of individuals. Uh, that was actually a good way of saying it, because that's exactly also what, what I experience. And that collectively, you do more, or at least you have the opportunity to, to create more than individually. Mm. So that we know. So, so I think that was actually a quite good way of saying it. Mm. So that's what happens. So the, the dynamics between people somehow uh, yeah, influence uh, how, how, how things will, will turn out instead of uh, being individuals. So uh, yeah, it was, yeah, that was just a very good uh, could, could you actually argue then that if, rela and I fully agree with that, by the way, that it, relationship and relationship building is so important for a leader that it, you know, time is kind of like the, uh, the currency of relationship as well. I mean that's uh, all the way also from the from the little prince and the story about it. you know it's, time is really uh, essence here. Could you argue then that at least from from where I sit, not only private companies but also actually public companies are making more and more, especially organizational changes, at a quicker and quicker pace, where you have to relate to new people all the time. Could you say that's almost like an enemy for the relationship building, and could that actually be something that we should worry about? Uh, I, my, you know, my own answer would be yes. I think there is too much change with the because uh, you know for the, you know where you kind of like it's, it's it's an easy change to to to, um, to to change the organization. It always looks good on paper, by the way. You can always argue why it's a good idea, right? So you know, it, it, and, and I just worry that with mm. the relationship building and that being so important, which I fully uh, also believe in and and and, uh, and, and support. The, so. Maybe that's for later, but I do think that there's something about the organization and building that can be tricky if there are constant changes. I totally agree, as well. And I think it's if you are the kind of uh, I I mostly work with the the executive suite, right? So I, if you are the type of executive who needs to use organizational change, you know, an organizational structure change as your only, yeah. you know, tool for changing the organization, then you are not a very no. competent manager, right? I mean, yeah. we all know that the organizations are basically, you know, global networks of people who want to be connected, who actually belong to the mm -hmm. to the family of Lego, right? Mm -hmm. That's how mm -hmm. we all identify. And that's why I think that we should really respect relationships. And actually, in your opening, yes, but my worry, the my, my, my most sort of, you know, fierce worry right now is actually not the team in itself because I think during COVID we've been sort of we've had all these weird conversations mm. from our bedrooms and with the dogs <laughs> and the kids and all this stuff I'm worrying about the social relationships between the teams you know all the cross organizational yes, yes. stuff yeah. all the flirting at the the Christmas yeah, yeah, party yeah, yeah. and all the relationships mm. because mm. at the end of the day mm. organizations are human you know organisms where yeah. we are all connected and social obligation is basically the only obligation that makes you stand up at 4.30 and do the last part of the presentation or whatever you do, right? You're obligated to, towards somebody. Uh, and, and that's my worry. You know, how do we make sure that on the days where you're at the office, you can actually talk to those other guys from mm -hmm. the other teams 
and stuff like that. Exactly. Because that's that's hard. No, no, you're right, and I think online meetings in particular is very they're very purpose driven, right? So mm -hmm. you go into this meeting mm -hmm. with a particular purpose, mm -hmm. uh, and and I actually realized after a few months uh, last year that. Um, you know, I, I probably had expected my team to actually mingle uh, around in the meeting. So they would create their own uh, own hangout meetings on Friday afternoon or whatever. Mm -hmm. That happened for a few, but it actually didn't happen for most of them. Mm -hmm. So I actually had you to had take to the facilitator role, yeah. role and I had mm -hmm. to organize it, which was, you know, which would never happen in the, you know, like the real world. So mm -hmm. again, I think that's something to be aware of, that mm -hmm. not everybody will just normally, you know, reach out to people and, and mm -hmm. create those different relationships online. So it's definitely not. And I think we are talking about the mm -hmm. wrong things, right? If we were in a physical workplace, we would talk much more about each other, right? Mm -hmm. We would say, good to see you, Phil. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen you forever, yeah. Pierre. You know, yeah. how's your mom doing? And that, that the whole personal layer of conversation is, is just not there right, right now. And, I, and, and we are, I would argue that, so I've had a few teams that have actually, just like you, Jesper, organized, you know, Thursday evening, uh, you know, informal mm. drinks, yes. from the, and then they've actually, you know, they've, they've sent out questions like, what was the most awkward or embarrassing thing you did when you were a teenager, you know, what was the <laughs> blah, blah, you know, personal questions that are okay to answer, but I really got them awkward, right, yeah. where you get to know yeah. each other, and that has worked, mm. but you Definitely. have to structure it, it's not like when you sit over lunch and you actually ask those, uh, those weird questions, so those sure. informal conversations yeah. that build relationships, we have ah. done a lot of these things. We have gaming on Fridays, we have check-ins on Tuesdays, and we, so we do a lot. And I think we have actually, I'm super proud of, of, of what has happened uh, from, from that. And I've, we all feel in the team that we are closer, mm -hmm. as you also say. Mm -hmm. So we're actually much closer than in the, in the real world, you can say. That is a little interesting, right? But then the question is, as, what you want to, I think, or in you as well, the concern about stakeholders or mm -hmm. the rest of the organization. Mm -hmm. So we have become even closer, and I'm super afraid with, to come back to your ears, but that that we are then this little united uh, yeah. <laughs> when we are creating us and them culture. Yeah, right? and, and yeah. So how do you suddenly engage uh, with with the rest of your mm -hmm. colleagues that are super important for the big results at the end? Mm -hmm. Because we cannot keep on doing that, but we have actually turned into that. Mm -hmm. into, so it is a little. Uh, it's a new. Um, yeah, it's a new <laughs> things we have never thought about before. Mm -hmm. that and there's something about uh, being out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. And therefore, if you, if you, <laughs> how would you meet someone who you hadn't thought about no, because you, you hadn't seen him or her? Mm -hmm. So, but you randomly uh, yeah. you know, dump into yeah. that person in, mm -hmm. in the in the uh, in the office, yeah. Yeah. someone from a different department, right? That you, and then that happens. Yeah. That just doesn't happen online. No. And, and, and yeah, so there's something interesting. Just, there. just very quickly before we go to Anne uh, Hyatt, I, I, I'd love to know. It sounds like the the style of your leadership uh, is constantly evolving, you know, and you're yeah. discovering stuff now that you, that wasn't in place then. And you know, if we hadn't had the pandemic, you'd have discovered something else. You know, how do you uh, how do you keep up with that evolution? I'm not so sure. It's you know I, I I partly agree and partly disagree with the uh, with the uh, assumption. I, I I a lot of the things that we need now we also need that 20 year, 20 years ago. Yes. Some of the things are just being accentuated yes, now, exactly. right? So you we, you know the, the 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 level of how you you make make sure that you show even clearer that you trust trust people, right? Uh, make it you know uh, do even more of the uh, uh, you know the, you could say the um, um, non-planned uh, interactions with your people. Uh, make sure that uh, everybody is, is, is included and, and engaged in a meeting, right? Everybody is now much more, especially in online meetings, much more, uh, you know, at the same level. No matter who you are, if the CEO, CEO or you, you'll still be a picture on the screen. So I think, so, and that, that we should also strive for in the real world to include everybody, the, the inclusion in the meeting. So, so nothing has changed in that respect. It's just being much more clearer now what needs to happen. So, so I actually do this, think it's to, to a large extent it's the same principles. And, and it goes back to what you said. I mean, I think it, it worked 25 years ago. It still works. It's just a different setting. And we, I think the, the real challenge is making it work in a different setting. So how do you create relations online? Mm. But it's still about creating relations, as an example. So, so I actually do think that's... Um, 
Yeah, now the big question: How do we then come back in normal? I mean, uh, we have. And we don't, right? No, no, we don't. We don't. No one wants to be normal. No, exactly. So, so for instance, we have learned that nature should be part of the future, mm. because that's one of the things we have learned and mm. that we have much better meetings when we walk. When we're outdoors. When we're yeah, outdoors, yeah. when you're free, you only have people in your head and, and no notifications, you're just present, you are with your colleague or your manager or whoever. Um, so how can that be brought in? So it's, it's super interesting that uh, that transition would be as awkward as mm. it I mean, true. Yeah, we have to unlearn again and then learn something new. No, definitely. Yeah, it's, Just it's imagine you suggesting that. Super. So to your question, yeah, it's exhausting in that sense. It keeps <laughs> on evolving, and then we, but we adapt, and it's it's just yeah. I don't think it's. That's great. Well, yeah. we're going to pause our thoughts there for the moment.